my pleasure tonight to uh, introduce David Ramser. He has just completed uh, the book that you've been signing and purchasing at the back of the room, uh, Melting the Ice Curtain, the dramatic story of how inspiration, courage, and persistence by Alaskan and Russian citizen diplomats stared down the Cold War to bridge a widening gap in superpower relations, a model sorely needed today. David Ramsey. Well, thanks so much for that uh, introduction, and thanks to Jeff, uh, there he is, for uh, helping arrange my visit here. I've been looking forward to coming to Sitka for a long time, and I'm pleased to be back. I visited uh, several times working for uh, previous governors, Governors Knowles and Cooper in years past. And the uh, historic capital of Russian America certainly is the place to be this year as we mark the 150th anniversary of the U.S. purchase. And so thank you for the opportunity. It also gives me a chance to wear my back in the USSR Beatles tie, which I don't get the opportunity to do so very often. So what I want to do is uh, talk about a groundbreaking time in Alaska's history, the melting of the Alaska-Russia ice curtain. For 40 years, this Cold War relic divided our countries and its citizens across the 55-mile Bering Strait. The era helped in the perilous Cold War and launched three decades of often chaotic but productive commercial, educational, scientific, and cultural ties across the international dateline. And as you can see here, I was honored to be a participant in the Ice Curtain era. Here, Governor Cooper and I stepped foot on Soviet soil for only the second time in our lives. This was in a little tiny village called Uellen, which is the Soviet Union's northeasternmost village on the very tip of the Asian continent. And from a high point of land close to this spot, you actually can see mainland Alaska across the strait at the village of Wales. And I often think how lucky uh, Governor Cooper and I were uh, to have survived this trip. I can still see the black smoke and oil spewing from this Aeroflot helicopter as we crisscrossed the Bering Sea in 1989. But let's begin this adventure a little earlier. What have I done? Anybody know how to advance the slide? Let's try this. There we go. I got it. OK, sorry. But let's begin this adventure a little bit earlier from uh, the mid-1980s, in fact, a century and a half earlier. Many Alaskans, including a lot of you all here, are marking the sesquicentennial anniversary of the US purchase of Russian America. And President Lincoln's Secretary of State, William Seward, who, as you know, is sitting to the left of the globe, negotiated what we now consider a great deal, $7.2 million, or about two cents an acre. And today, Alaska generates that much in just a few hours of oil production. And despite national derision at the time, Seward was enormously proud of this achievement. So proud that three years later, he traveled all the way here to Sitka, the capital of the new American possession. And here he articulated his vision for the important role Alaska played in advancing America's international interests. He believed Alaska could help a U.S.-Russia relationship and strengthen America's role in the world. Now today, given current events, the jury may still be out on that. And if nothing else, last year's election and the Trump-Putin relationship, whatever it may be, is keeping Russia in the news like never before. But let's return to that in a few minutes. And before anybody takes any offense at this photo, let me note that it is official fake news. <laughs> so much changed with America's acquisition of Alaska 150 years ago. But one thing that remained constant was interaction between the indigenous peoples of the region. Since the time of the Bering Land Bridge, about 30,000 years ago, these northern people have crossed the icy waters between, Alaska, between mainland Alaska and Russia for subsistence hunting and fishing and to share a similar culture. And here you can see the region that we're talking about. Uh, the little box uh, between uh, Alaska and Russia is uh, where the Diomedes are. Uh, 
as you know, the Diomedes are only two and a half miles apart at the closest point, and then the mainlands are about 55 miles apart. In uh, 1938, the U.S. and Soviet governments recognized the historic visitation between native people and established a formal process for interactions between them. It allowed visa-free uh, visits among native people and worked pretty well for about 10 years. And a productive U.S.-Soviet relationship continued during World War II. Nearly 8,000 American warplanes were delivered across the strait during Lend-Lease to help the Soviets fight the Nazis. But after all the goodwill generated during the war, Cold War suspicions froze decades of largely productive U.S.-Soviet relations. The Soviets banished natives who lived in villages on Big Diomede back to the mainland and established a border guard surveillance post aimed at Alaska. So FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover deemed that U.S. national security interests outweighed those of Alaska natives, and Joseph Stalin concurred. And so just 10 years after setting up this system that eased travel between Alaska and Russian natives, the two countries imposed an ice curtain. They sealed the border and banned all contact. This was imposed in May of 1948, and it lasted for 40 years. So fast forward through the Cold War to the mid-1980s, when a drumbeat for change began in the isolated Bering Strait. And it was the result of what I believe were three main factors. First, the memories of long-separated Native peoples were fading, and they wanted one last opportunity for reunif reunification before passing from the scene. As part of the research for my book, I interviewed a number of very elderly natives living in, on St. Lawrence Island, people in their 80s and 90s, who recalled visiting the Soviet Union in the 20s and 30s. Um, so you can see the, uh, the time that had spread. The second uh, factor was a progressive new Soviet leader came to power. Mikhail Gorbachev encouraged interactions with the West, which portrayed him to the world as a new type of reformist Soviet leader. And third, Alaska business and civic leaders started to detect an opening for interaction across the Bering Strait after 40 years. And so what followed were a series of headline-grabbing initiatives by Alaskan and Russian citizen diplomats to pressure their national governments to open the strait. One of the first was by a quirky realtor from Nome named Jim Stimfel. A Jim was married to a native woman and had heard from his wife's family of visits with Russian natives decades ago, and he wanted to do something to try to help reunite them. And one day, uh, well, Jim started writing letters to the governor's office to encourage us to get engaged, and we largely dismissed him as a bit of a kook. But one day, he happened to be at the Nome Dump, which is on a high spot in Nome, and noticed that there was a pretty swift wind blowing towards the Soviet Union, so he got an idea. He went to the National Weather Service and got a couple of big weather balloons, uh, blew them up using his car exhaust, and attached a couple little goodie bags of trade goods like sewing needles, uh, tea, chewing tobacco. Oops. Wonder what's happened here. Can we get our guy? Looks like the. Uh, well, as we're getting that back up, I'll tell you about um, Stemfel. So he uh, gets this little goodie bag together and hooks it to the weather balloon and launched it from the uh, dump and saw it uh, fly off into the sky, watched it through binoculars, and the balloon dropped down to the water and started bouncing along. And this boat came screaming by, picked up the balloon, threw it in the boat, and continued down the coast. And so Stimfel went uh, chasing down after this guy in his car. Turns out it was a buddy of his who uh, was so proud of this balloon that he had received from Russia. He wanted to let Stimfel know about it. <laughs> so Stimfel's balloons never made it to Russia, but uh, many of his continuing efforts did chip away at the ice curtain. Lost our connection. Okay. Let me just hold for a second. 
can't have a more spectacular setting than looking out here. Oh, the computer just went down. Yeah. Yeah, there was something on the screen. Great, thank you. <laughs> so those were uh, Stemple's efforts. Another Alaskan uh, who attempted to help melt the ice curtain was Dixie Belcher, who's a Juno musician and peace advocate who was inspired to ease Cold War tensions. In 1986, she secured permission from the Soviet Union, which was a pretty amazing feat in itself, for 67 Alaska natives and other performers to sing and dance their way across the Soviet Union to promote peace. And Governor Hammond here and his wife Bella joined Dixie's trip and their performances received all sorts of international media attention. But I think the most important result of, Vic, of Dixie's initiatives was befriending a Soviet official, this guy in the middle here, who probably did more to open the Bering Strait than anybody. This guy is Gennady Gerasimov, who was Gorbachev's spokesman. He's a former uh, newspaper editor in Russia, spoke perfect English, knew American slang, was uh, on, in the international media all the time. And after Dixie invited him to Alaska a few times, and he saw how close Russia and Alaska were, he was really inspired to work inside the Kremlin to uh, push Gorbachev and other Soviet officials to approve a lot of these initiatives. And uh, Dixie's work uh, through Gerasimov helped secure permission for Alaska Airlines' friendship flight two years later. Another persistent Alaskan was Dr. Ted Mala, who was the son of a dashing Hollywood playboy, the Alaska native actor Ray Mala, who starred in the, uh, in the old film The Eskimo. And Mala's mother was a Russian princess and distant relative of, La of Russia's last czar. And Ted's parents died at an early age, so he was raised by his Russian grandmother in Hollywood and was curious about his native roots uh, after he finished medical school. So he returned to Alaska, worked at UAA for many years, and happened to be at a conference in Anchorage one time that a bunch of Russians attended. They found out that he uh, had connections to the last czar of Russia. So of course they invited him over, and that began uh, 30-year career of his of dealing with Alaska and Russia and trying to promote better relations. Another person who was inspired to bridge the politically, uh, the bit to bridge the Bering Strait politically was a California endurance swimmer named Lynn Cox, who became the first to swim between the Diomede Islands in 1987 in nothing but a speedo, goggles, and swim cap. And the temperature was about 38 degrees. And here she is land, about to land on Big Diomede. There's a funny story about this. She was accompanied by a flotilla of doctors swimming along for a couple of hours in this water. And uh, got close to Big Diomede. And the Russians had made a big deal out of this. They had a waiter in a white suit serving tea out of a samovar and little picnic tables. But they were down the beach a little. So as she's ready to crash on the beach here, the Russians yell at her, don't land here, swim down to us here. <laughs> so she could barely move her arms anymore, but finally gets to the beach here and uh, crashes up on the rocks. And when I interviewed her about this, one of her most distinct memories was uh, a couple of Soviet soldiers had to reach down and grab her by her wrists and pull her out and set her on the beach because she couldn't, couldn't get herself out of the water. She was so cold. And she remembers the warmth of the hands of these Soviet soldiers on her wrist when she was pulled out. But you can see it's a snow-covered beach, pretty amazing feat. So Lynn's feat uh, drew attention to Cold War tensions and won her audiences with the Pope, with President Reagan, and a state dinner salute from Gorbachev. So all these efforts and more to chip away at the ice curtain 
um, culminated in 1988 with the first initiative with serious business and political support, which was Alaska Airlines Friendship Flight. On June 13, 1988, the first ever U.S. jet departed Nome and 45 minutes later sat down on Providenia's run gravel runway carrying 82 passengers. It was uh, business and political leaders, uh, 30 mostly native elders, reporters, and other hangers-on. And one of the natives on this flight was the young Siberian Yupik woman pictured here, Darlene Pangawi Orr, who I'm pleased to say is a Sitka resident and joins us here. Darlene, thanks for coming. And what I wanted to do is read just a couple sentence description of this from the book, which I think it says it better than I would summarize it. <laughs> or, a 26-year-old Siberian Yupik, grew up in Alaska in the shadow of what Ronald Reagan just five years earlier had branded the evil empire. From her St. Lawrence Island village, she could make out the Soviet mainland on the western horizon. I have drawings from when I was young at the mountains on the Russian side with snow on the hillsides, and you could see the sun on the hills over there, said Orr, whose great-grandfather was born in the pre-Soviet village of Old Chaplino on Russia's far eastern coast. It was unattainable, yet you could see it. Walking her village shoreline as a young girl, she would occasionally find strange little books in sealed plastic bags on the gravelly beach. They were Bibles translated into Cyrillic, dropped by American missionaries per splash up onto Soviet beaches just 36 miles away. If the finder was lucky, the package might include a stick of gum. Quote, on the shortwave radio, we would occasionally hear Russian, Orr said. For me, growing up, that was the language of spies. I always envisioned frogmen crawling, coming out of the water. So Darlene, uh, as a result of living there, uh, was inspired to learn Russian. And so she was the only person on the flight that day who spoke Russian, Siberian Yupik, and English. And here she's pictured in uh, downtown Providenia with Michael Krauss, who's a UAF linguist who was very active in uh, promoting this flight. So I got a choice seat on the flight as Governor Cooper's press secretary. And like uh, many Americans of my generation, I practiced hiding from Soviet A-bombs under my elementary school desk. And I uh, discovered during doing research for the book that my dad was a career Marine, and one of his jobs was arming missiles with nuclear warheads for use against the Soviets in the 50s. So the Soviet Union sort of played a, a, a major role in my life, too. So like Darlene, I was pretty nervous on this first trip to the USSR. Keep in mind, in the same general neighborhood of the Russian Far East just five years earlier, a Korean Airlines jet had taken off from Anchorage and uh, drifted into Soviet airspace and was shot out of the sky, killing 269 people. So I think all of us on the flight were sort of thinking about that as we started to land. You may uh, remember in Anchorage there was a sort of uh, comedy show guy, uh, Dr. White Keys, who used to encourage people to get pictures uh, with Kansas Spam in odd places. And so this Ras Rasputin looking guy in the shades and beard uh, was the UPI bureau chief at the time, Jeff Berliner, and he brought the Spam. <laughs> and so I often tell people there are only two people smiling in this photo, me and Vladimir Lenin on the side of the uh, community hall in <laughs> Providenia. So the friendship flight and the many initiatives which preceded it launched a nearly 30-year era of frenzied emotional and often successful interactions in business, culture, science, and education. And after the flight, Alaskans and Soviets simply couldn't get enough of each other. Quick explanation of these photos. Uh, the top corner there you can see youthful-looking Senator Murkowski and Governor Cooper. The guy in the middle is uh, Mayor Kalinkin from Providenia. And he worked with Jim Stemfel to encourage a lot of the interactions of the era. Sometime later, uh, he was uh, shot gangland style, as happened to a lot of the Soviet leaders of this era. The woman in the bottom picture is Jenna Brelsford, and she did international trade for Cooper um, and was our leading trade specialist in the Soviet Union. And she was so inspired by dealing with Russia that she signed up for a uh, 
expedition to ski and dog sled from Chukotka, Russia, all the way across the Bering Strait to Kotzebue. It took about three months, and she ended up marrying one of the Russian explorers who went along on the trip. And she's sitting on a, a Russian limousine. It's a chaika, which means a seagull in Russian. You can sort of see the seagull emblem on the grill there. And then this fellow over here is Dave Heatwald uh, from Anchorage. He was a former ARCO engineer. Um, he is one of the few Alaskans who actually made pretty good money working in Russia during this era. So this cartoon is from the Anchorage Daily News uh, by Peter Dunlap Scholl, and I think it's a good summary of the era. This uh, Russian woman has just visited Alaska and returned, and she says, the prosperity of the West is a sham, Boris. There, there is a facade of wealth, but as you can see, this jewelry I bought is made of moose nuggets. So one of the most lasting legacies of this era was creation of the American Russian Center at UAA in 1993. And it was fueled by about $26 million in federal money, mostly earmarks from Senator Stevens. And the American Russian Center did two tracks of programs. It set up business training centers in seven uh, major population centers in the Russian Far East. And these were staffed by an Alaskan and a Russian, usually housed at universities. And the whole goal was to teach up and coming Russian entrepreneurs Western business practices. And then we also ran cultural and educational programs. And I worked there for a couple of years and administered the first Stevens earmark of $2 million for educational and cultural exchanges. And uh, this job took me to the Russian Far East many times. Um, and there were no, no banking system or credit card system at the time, and so we, every, all of our business was a cash transaction. You can see Tiffany, who is opening the Magadan office with a fistful of rubles here. We used to have to carry like $10,000 taped to our body to go into Russia to do business for a couple weeks, which drove the university accountants crazy because they insisted on receipts for all that stuff. But over 15 years of operations, nearly 60,000 Russians were touched by UAA's business development and cultural programs. And one of the more successful programs was by a woman from Juneau named Joanne Grady. Uh, she received a grant from the American Russian Center and did groundbreaking work in setting up women's centers in the Soviet Union at a time when this was a pretty foreign concept. So she worked in both Magadan and Petropavlos on the Kamchatka Peninsula, setting up these women's centers to improve the treatment of women in uh, Russia. And during the heyday of Alaska-Russian interaction, there was a flurry of activity across the strait. Alaska Airlines and other carriers, such as Bering Air out of Nome, Revolution from Anchorage, and Russian carriers like Aeroflot established regular air links. You could get on a plane in Anchorage and fly to Magadan four hours later. It's like flying to Seattle. It was so easy. Businesses explored joint ventures from beer breweries to oil refineries. More than a dozen sister city relationships were established. Uh, you may be familiar, Juno and Vladivostok were sister cities, Anchorage and Magadan. I got roped into uh, participating in one of the Vladivostok trips with Juno. And a couple days before we left in 91, um, a, a bear cub had been orphaned in Juneau, and some wiseacre thought it would be great to present this cub to the Russians as a friendship uh, symbol. So we stuffed the bear in a little dog kennel, flew it over to Vladivostok. Fish and game guy got the bear out with his leather gloves and presented it to the Russian official. The bear almost took the guy's thumb off. It was just a furious little bear. Hopefully it didn't uh, create any international incidents. Um, another benefit from this era was about three dozen rotary clubs were set up in the Russian Far East uh, by Alaskans. And lots of good work was done uh, introducing the notion of community service, which is sort of a foreign concept in Russia. And a lot of good work was done for elderly folks and uh, youth. And scores of Alaskans and Russians also got married during this era, and many of those marriages continue. A couple of explanations of these photos. Uh, the, this is the second Alaska Airlines flight to land in Russia in 1989 in a Nadir. Uh, the temperature's about 10 below with about a 40 knot wind. 
And this is to kick off that uh, Bering Bridge expedition, ski expedition that I mentioned. Uh, Governor Knowles and his counterpart, Sakhalin Governor Farkudinov. Uh, Sakhalin is the island just north of Japan, site of a big oil and gas development, and a lot of Alaskans uh, worked there and still do work there. Um, sometime after this, well, Farkudinov and Knowles became uh, good buddies, and Farkudinov came to Alaska many times. Sometime after this, he was killed in a mysterious airplane or helicopter crash uh, surveying oil and gas properties in his region. And this guy down at the bottom is Doug Drum, who runs Indian Valley Meats, a meat processing plant in Anchorage. And he's sort of the example of the quintessential Alaskan who went to Russia for all the right reasons to try to benefit the Russians. In his case, he wanted to try to improve the efficiency of how they process reindeer. There are hundreds of thousands of reindeer in the Russian Far East, and there's just enormous waste, or at least there was then, I think there still is now. And so Doug invested a lot of personal money taking processing equipment over, showed the Russians how to more efficiently make reindeer sausage, and he set up a three-way system to get paid. So he would help them process reindeer, he would get the horns, which he then took to Korea and sold as aphrodisiacs and, and medicine. And uh, the Russians sh uh, soon got onto this deal and cut out Doug and went directly to the Koreans. So he lost a couple million dollars in Alaska. He's st still pretty bitter over it. So by the late 1990s, relations across the strait began to cool for five key reasons, I think. First, the Russian economy which was just simply too chaotic for Westerners, including Alaskans, to deal there. There was a sudden devaluation of the ruble in August of 1998 under President Yeltsin, and Western companies just walked away. Dave Heatwald, the ARCO guy, uh, one of his jobs was representing Carr Gottstein, and they had a big warehouse full of food in Magadan, full of hot dogs and strawberries and ice cream that they were selling successfully to the Russians. Well, overnight, the value of this food dropped in half because of the devaluation of the ruble, and Carr Gottstein just walked away, as did a lot of other American companies. Alaska Airlines, after operating for about five years, decided to end service in October of 98, and there were a couple of incidents. Um, uh, some of the Alaska Airlines guys I talked to said flying over there every day was like giving birth. Every flight was like giving birth because it was such a hassle. They had to put a mechanic on each flight. Uh, one time, an Alaska Airlines jet landed in Magadan in the middle of the summer, and the plane iced up mysteriously in the summer. Of course, the Russians had no de-icing fluid, and so the plane was stranded on the ground. What do you do? So the pilot had a bright idea. I sent a couple guys up to the liquor store, and they came back with a few cases of vodka, poured it into an old pump fire extinguisher, and sprayed it on the wing. Sure enough, the plane took off successfully. A more dangerous incident happened in Sakhalin. Um, an Alaska Airlines jet was taking off in Sakhalin, and the airstrip there was made out of bricks, and they would fill the holes in the bricks with hot tar and sort of melt it into the bricks. So this plane was taken off, sucked hot tar into the engine. The engine exploded. They got the plane on the ground. Nobody was hurt, but it created a huge international incident. Alaska Airlines had to fly in a new engine at great expense. And a couple of weeks later, the CEO of Alaska said, we're out of here. Another reason was uh, earmarks to the American Russian Center started drying up. Uh, Russia was no longer sexy, and money started going to Afghanistan instead. And I think the thrill was gone for Alaskans hosting Russians. I don't know how much uh, Russian traffic you got down here, but I remember for years showing up at the airport in Anchorage with uh, these people who would come, I would have to put up in my home for weeks at a time. They had no money. You'd feed them, schlep them around town. And year after year, this got a little bit old. And so the, the novelty wore off. And the final reason is uh, Putin came to power in 2000. And that was initially welcomed by the Western um, business community because he stabilized the economy. But he also re-centralized power. Under Gorbachev and Yeltsin, they passed laws to extend authority to the regions to negotiate with Western companies and engage in civic uh, activities. Under Putin, all that's pulled back to Moscow. And so interaction with the West is discouraged. 
and there's a lot of harassment of Westerners. I was just uh, in Russia last summer, spent two weeks going up the Bering Strait in a couple of open whale boats, and for a minor, minor paperwork violation, we got arrested by the border guards, uh, detained for 16 hours, paraded in front of a federal judge, and fined 500 rubles, which is like eight bucks. But it was a big hassle, and I think that they just do a lot of petty harassment to show people who, who's boss. So despite these setbacks, I'm trying to be optimistic about uh, Russia these days. And I believe Alaska's model of citizen diplomacy does offer lessons for overall US-Russia relations. And I've gleaned what I think are about five lessons from the ice curtain era, which are instructive for today. First, I think that we Alaskans can explain perplexing Russian behavior to other Americans, because I think we know Russians a little bit better. Now, Americans are always snickering at these pictures of Putin riding horseback shirtless or being a fighter pilot. Um, but this stuff plays very well in Russia. Russians love a strong leader. They love Putin because he stands up to the West. He uh, is polling about 80% job approval back there. Of course, it helps that he controls all the media in the country and the political system, and there's really not much um, opposition. Um, keep in mind, as you see the sort of daily headlines about Putin and Trump, that Putin really has two goals in life, keeping himself in office and making Russia great again. And by and large, I think Russians agree with that. Second, I think both sides are well advised to avoid diplomatic slights, which set back relationships. When President Obama came into office, he and Putin began on pretty decent terms. Uh, we attempted to reset relations between the two countries and actually achieved a fair amount of progress. But things quickly went south after uh, Obama dismissed Russia as a regional power, which offended the Russians to no end. So we need to avoid those sort of um, inadvertent um, comments. Third, we have seen that science can help overcome politics. During the Cold War, and even now, joint scientific research between Alaska and Russia has continued, leading to promising areas of cooperation. And I think the area of greatest potential cooperation between the two countries is in the Arctic. Keep in mind that nearly half of the world's Arctic falls within Russia. And we all know that the only reason the US is an Arctic nation is because of Alaska. So I think that we potentially can play a major role here in working with Russia to manage a changing Arctic. Fourth, native links can help build bridges, and today we certainly need stronger bonds in that area. One of the great achievements from the Ice Curtain era was bilateral approval of visa-free travel by natives of the region. And that does continue today, although it struggles from bureaucratic challenges and lack of funding. And fifth and finally, I believe there's a lot of merit in the personal relationships Alaskans and Russians established across the strait. We're both northern people, very distant from our national capitals. We face similar problems to which similar solutions can work. And organizations like the Northern Forum, the Institute of the North, and there's an international winter cities organization of mayors have demonstrated that we can solve common problems across international borders. I wanted to commend Governor Walker because his two predecessors had uh, withdrew, withdrawn Alaska from the Northern Forum, which is a, an organization of northern, go, northern regional governments, and Walker has Alaska back in the Forum, so we're finally interacting again with Russia. And people like Juno's Jana Lelchik here in the center of uh, her Russian high school students in Juno uh, has helped promote Russian culture and language and kept relations across the strait alive. So I want to read one last section of the book, which is the last couple of sentences to wrap up here. On my last day in the Russian Far East in the summer of 2016, I was up early, nervous about the flying weather. After two fascinating yet frustrating weeks along Russia's remote Bering Sea coast, I was ready for American normalcy. Russia always has this effect. It is irritatingly unpredictable while there, but I'm always eager to return. The low clouds hanging over Providenia had us anxious about misconnections and messed up lives back home. 
With nothing to do but wait, I headed out into Providenia's dusty streets for a few last minute photos. On the crumbling concrete steps of the community hall, the 28 years earlier had been ground zero for melting the ice curtain. I remembered the elation among the Alaskan and Siberian Yupik who had reconnected after four decades. I remembered the enthusiasm of the business leaders who envisioned new markets for Alaska services and new Russian resources ripe for development. And I remembered my own relief that everyday Soviets were not the red menace of my childhood, but pretty much like us. As I stood there feeling glum over the passing of an era of such high expectations, a local Russian rushed up, interrupting my thoughts. Recognizing me as a foreigner, he asked in bro broken English where I was from. When I told him Alaska, he pointed at the eastern horizon and with a wide grin gave me a hearty thumbs up. So there are a lot more detail and crazy stories about this era in my book, Melting the Ice Curtain, uh, which I have for sale in the back. Uh, as we know, it's published by the University of Alaska Press, started in June 1. It's actually doing quite well. We sold out the first run, and we're in the second uh, printing right now after just uh, six weeks. Um, you can check my uh, website for details about other book events if you get around the state. And spasibo bolshoi. Thank you. So you want to do questions, if anybody has any? I think uh, they want to pass the mic. I got one. What? Thank you, Hal. What in the world were you doing? What, what were you doing two weeks in a whale boat? <laughs> I had last visited some of these villages with Governor Cooper in the mid-1980s when they were under, uh, under the Soviet Union. And so I wanted to see how they had changed since the Soviet Union collapsed. And uh, what happened was under uh, the Soviet Union, they invested a lot of money in collective enterprises to try to provide a little bit of economy to these villages. So in a little place like Providenia, you'd have a dairy a cooperative and a vegetable growing operation and an auto repair shop. And these little uh, collective enterprises paid double salaries what people would get in Moscow. So it attracted a lot of people to the region. Well, after the Soviet Union collapsed, all the, these resources uh, dried up and all these people moved back to uh, Western Russia. And so, a lot of these villages, very remote, are back to their native roots, uh, subsistence roots. They're subsistence hunters and fishermen. They've formed uh, hunting cooperatives to try to feed the families uh, in the villages. And things are, um, I, I would say, fairly grim over there. I think they're worse off than uh, a lot of our native villages just across the coast. But it's a high security region because it borders on Alaska, and you have to have special permits. We had our permit, but we had done a day trip where we drove and left the permit where we were staying. And when the border guards asked for our special permit, we didn't have it, and so they decided to harass us. Hey. How are you, Jonathan? Don't ask me how to solve the state budget crisis. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, well, I, I had a question about two different, I, I guess, references you, you mentioned um, of, of one, I guess, a regional governor and the other being the mayor of, I, I can't remember the community, both dying under mysterious circumstances, and that was morbid and curious enough that I, I wanted to ask if, I mean, what the backstory is, and you mentioned that that was not an uncommon occurrence after the downfall of the Soviet Union, and if you could speak more to that was Mayor Kalinkin, who was the mayor of Providenia, which is the first city that Alaskans started going to in the 1980s, uh, the site of the friendship flight. And what happened was a lot of these guys would get into office and they would be public officials for 10 or 15 years. And then they would move into the Russian style of, um, of the private sector. And there's a lot of mafia and organized crime in Russia, particularly during this period. And so these guys would just get on the wrong side. And the New York Times, uh, I quote in my book, published a long list of all these Rus former Russian politicians who had been killed 
after they left office and started engaging with the private sector. And so people would just take them out and put a bullet in the back of the head, which is, I think, what happened to Kalinkin. I actually tried to chase down the actual circumstances of his death, and I never could get anybody to, in Providenia to tell me about it. I talked to dozens of people, and nobody would fess up to exactly what happened. So I think there's a lot of nervousness about it. I have a question, David. Sure. Um, when we were putting together our Over the Near Horizon a program with the Russian American Colony Singers, uh, I was introduced to a woman who has a, product, a project going in Big Diomede and Little Diomede about the reunification of relatives there. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, that's Tandy Wallach, who runs Circumpolar Expeditions in Anchorage. And she's the one who organized our trip to Russia last year. There were nine of us on it. And um, one of the uh, positive developments that's continued during this era is a National Park Service initiative called Beringia. And the original idea was to have an international park to span the Bering Strait. Well, a lot of our conservative national legislators objected to that because of sovereignty issues and thought it would mess with uh, mining and oil and gas development. But the National Park Service continues to spin off grants. And so Tandy has a small grant. And she's bringing a number of Russians from the Russian mainland to Little Diomede for a reunion next month. And um, I applaud her for trying to keep uh, interaction going across the strait. I mean, during the heyday of all this, stuff like that happened every week. Now it happens every few years. But Tandy is one of the people that's still keeping it up. Darlene continues to do good work in Russia as well. She's a specialist in uh, botany and Russian plants and has worked over there. How many times have you been there? 14. 14 times to mostly the Russian Far East. Other questions? I had one about, uh, I know for a while there was a flurry of um, joint ventures between um, Alaska uh, uh, processors and Russian uh, fisheries. Mm -hmm. And then they seem to have tanked for maybe during that period where the ruble was devalued. Right. And then, do you know, are there any currently, and is there scientific cooperation in terms of fisheries information? There is some scientific cooperation. I don't know about specifically fisheries. For example, I know about a, way, a walrus monitoring study that's going on between Russian scientists and scientists at UA Fairbanks. And I don't think there are any more uh, Russian, Russian US fishing ventures underway. I talked to a couple guys in Seattle who worked in that area some time ago, but they said they've been out of it for a while. You've got to put the microphone to your mouth for it to be recorded. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> My question is this. I know that, um, you know, Cuba was cut off from the United States and they couldn't get um, equipment or parts to keep machinery running. And so those people became experts at fixing equipment with almost nothing. And so when they, when they have real um, resources, uh, they just almost can't believe it. And I wonder if there's that spirit in rural Russia where they don't have access to um, ready uh, equipment and high technology and such. Do they have that spirit of being able to uh, fixed things with, you know, like MacGyver or something. <laughs> I think there is something to that. The trip we did um, last summer, we hired three Russian boat crews. Uh, these guys were uh, walrus and whale hunters, and they were uh, expert seamen. And we were in 18-foot aluminum open whale boats bouncing up the Bering Sea coast all the way to the northern part of uh, Russia. And we were a little bit nervous about it. Um, in 1995, I think it was, there were, a, I forget how many, four or five uh, scientists, US scientists, including some Alaskans, 
who did a similar trip, but they were in walrus skin boats, and there was some horrible accident, and they and 13 other people all drowned. Um, and so nobody knows if a whale came up under the boats, if the captains were drunk and took um, um, chance, more chances than they should have. But that kind of weighed very heavily on our mind as we were going up the coast. But these guys were amazing. I mean, we got in some pretty rough seas in these small boats, and they could get us across without beating us up too much. A couple times we were bouncing along, and the engines would stop. And so we were out in the middle of the Bering Sea, and they'd get them going again pretty quickly, and we'd start up again. Thank you. Sure. Anything else? Any other hard ones? In my exercise. <laughs> Phil Donahue. Um, I just wondered uh, how often uh, you're getting back to Russia these days. Well, I haven't been back since last summer. Uh, I worked for Senator Begich until he did not get reelected. And then I went over to Moscow in 2015 um, at a conference. There's a thing called the uh, Dartmouth Conversation that actually began in the 60s at Dartmouth College. And the whole idea is to get sort of high level former government officials of Russia and the United States to continue talking. And I got invited to go to this conference because I befriended uh, one of these Russian think tanks in DC when I was back there. So we spent a couple weeks uh, in Moscow uh, meeting with our counterparts. And it was pretty high level folks. We met with a number of Russian cabinet officers. But it amazed me that during this time, there was virtually no communication between the United States and Russia, except for occasionally Secretary Kerry was talking to his counterpart but there was no sort of low level communication to try to keep relations alive. And that was the point of this uh, Dartmouth conversation was to try to keep talking to Russians no matter how bad the national politics get. A friend, uh, one of the people that were on our trip uh, has gone to Russia since we were arrested and she uh, checked into customs in St. Petersburg and they said, oh, I see you were arrested in the Russian Far East. So there's a record of it, but they let her in, so it wasn't a problem. So I hope to go back. Anything else? OK. One, one of the things you mentioned was that the, the interest in, in Americans, uh, among Americans, to you know, the intrigue of Russia is not there. And you kind of alluded to that. My experience is that there's still great interest among Russian people in exchanging with America. Is that something that you perceive? That's what we found when we were in the Far East. Uh, there's a lot of love for Alaska. A lot of these Russians uh, have been to Alaska many times. We went to the uh, ivory carving school in UL in this tiny little village, uh, about as far from civilization as you can get. And this master ivory carver showed up in sweatpants from Kotzebue, Alaska, of all places, which was pretty funny. He had been over several times. And they all want to come, ba come back here, but it's very expensive and it's hard to do. Unless you have like a Beringia grant like uh, Tandy does, uh, these folks just don't have the resources to come to Alaska. I recall a um, woman pastor from Barrow making connections with families. Did you see much of that? Well, I don't know about that specific event. Uh, most of the exchanges were sort of focused on the St. Lawrence Island and Nome region. I don't think, well, there was some um, sci joint scientific studies bef between the North Slope Borough and some of the, uh, their counterparts in the Chukotka region. Um, and she was a woman who uh, learned to speak Russian uh -huh. so she could help this happen. And this would have been like 20 years ago, as I recall. There's a really interesting guy in Anchorage. He's uh, a, a born and raised Alaskan named Michael Shields. 
And from as a young boy, he's always wanted to be a Catholic priest. And so I don't know if you've heard of Archbishop Hart Hurley. He used to run the Catholic Diocese in Anchorage. And he was really hot to trot on uh, Alaska. So he took this young priest over to Magadan. And the priest said, oh, boy, I want nothing to do with this place. Get me out of here. And he went to some sort of spiritual retreat to find out what he wanted to do with his life. And he said the Lord told him to go pray with the survivors of the gulags in Magadan. So this guy's been back in Magadan for 25 years, didn't speak a word of English, but he's dedicated his life to this little Catholic diocese on the outskirts of Magadan and plans to, uh, to die there. He said he plans to be buried there. He's a pretty incredible guy. I profile four people at the very end of the book, two Alaskans who moved to Russia and stayed, including this guy, and then two Russians who moved to Alaska and stayed. I just want to say a special thank you to you for coming and talk to, talking to us about this. Uh, it's such a different perspective than we have looked at during the sesquicentennial. And I really appreciate the observations about business and about international politics, and I hope that we can engage you and get you back here more often because it's another way of viewing things that we have not talked enough about. And I, I really do appreciate you coming. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, more. Well, this is um, a question about are people still going back and forth from Alaska to Russia across the Bering Straits, or do they have to go all the way th across the United States and Europe and, and through Moscow to get back over there? The only uh, regular service is charter service from Nome. There's a little air carrier up there called Bering Air, and you can charter over, and they go to Providenia or to Anadir, which is the capital of Chukotka. And in the summertime, there's a Russian air carrier that provides service, just charter service for like six weeks. And they fly from uh, the Kamchatka Peninsula to Anchorage, and they mostly cater to sport hunters and fishermen who want to go to the Kamchatka Peninsula. So those are the only two ways to fly to Russia. Uh, if you want to fly, for example, to Magadan or Vladivostok, most people go to Korea and then fly north up the coast. Or you can go all the way around the world to Moscow and then across the, the Russia, which is the long way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to uh, get into this or not. What, any thoughts about uh, Mr. Trump and Mr. Putin and where, where that will go or could go? Or uh, it's kind of hard to tell. I think uh, Putin's getting the best of us these days. Um, you know, Trump came into office saying he was going to improve relations with Russia. I don't think he's done that. I think, if anything, they're worse. And it seems to me that uh, Putin is taking a lot of advantage of the United States. I do think Trump is sort of uniquely positioned to achieve some things with Russia. I'm skeptical that it'll happen, but sort of like Nixon went to China and negotiated a great trade deal, this is the anti-communist Richard Nixon. If Trump could get something from Russia, like get put pressure on Russia to end the war in Syria, or to get Russia to pull out of the Ukraine, I don't think those things are likely to happen, but if Trump could achieve something significant to benefit the world, you know, I think a lot of people would give him the benefit of the doubt. Hi. So you said you've been to Russia in the early 90s, yes. and I'm sure you've noticed a lot of changes. So what is your opinion? Do you think the changes that, are, that have been happening and are happening right now, do you think they're for, for the best or for the better? Well, I guess it depends what part you're talking about. I think it's hard to tell whether the uh, very remote natives directly across the Bering Strait from Alaska are better off. 
Uh, the folks that we dealt with seemed quite happy, but there's very little cash economy. Uh, they do receive some subsidies for housing. Um, all these little villages have schools, and they teach the native language to try to encourage the preservation of the culture and the language. But I, in terms of material goods, I don't think they're very well off. I don't know if Darlene has an opinion on this. In the cities, um, Moscow rivals any uh, Western capital city that I've ever been. I'm in boom in a way. There is, you know, Rolls Royces and Mercedes. There's enormous wealth there, but I think it's mostly in the top two percent of the country. As you, we drove outside of Moscow in 2015 when I was over there, and as you leave the environs of Moscow, you see the quality of the cars begin to decline, and the quality of the housing and uh, these little Russian houses that are sort of soaking into the mud, which is such a contrast to Moscow, which is, I mean, one of the most exciting cities I've ever been in these days. Rich? Um, oh. I've been working in Eastern Europe in the Caucasus, and uh, when I'm in Georgia, Gori is the town where Stalin was born, and there is a constant stream of Russian tourists going to Gori, and they're not going to learn about the horrors of Stalin. It's almost worshipful to go there. Uh, I'm wondering if there's Stalin nostalgia in the Russian Far East uh, and in the other parts of Russia you go, or are these just some self-selected nuts who, um, who go to Gori to worship Stalin. Well, I subscribe to a bunch of foreign policy websites and blogs and things, and I, there was a recent poll that said the second most popular person in Russia next to Putin is Stalin, which is pretty amazing. I mean, I didn't see any sense of that in the Far East, but the Far East tends to be a little bit more conservative than Western Russia, so I suspect there is a sort of soft spot for the, the old tyrant. There was an, a guy, um, uh, during the Yeltsin period, they had uh, the creation of what they called oligarchs, who were these uh, wealthy Russian businessmen who would sort of game the system and, and accumulate enormous wealth. And there was a guy named um, Abramovich, who was one of the richest guys in the world, and he uh, was elected governor of Chukotka. I don't think he'd ever been to Chukotka, in part because, um, uh, if you got elected to office like this, you uh, uh, got immunity from any sort of prosecution. So a lot of these oligarchs got themselves elected to the Duma. But this guy was really taken with Chukotka, and he poured millions of dollars into this region. And um, uh, people who lived in these little tiny hovels that were sinking into the mud were replaced by these modern homes designed by uh, Canadians up on stilts that had running water and sewer. And so Abramovich in the Chukotka region is treated like a god. You go into people's homes and there's pictures of Abramovich in there. I've got a picture of him in the book in a sauna that we went in in the Russian Far East and he hasn't been around for 10 years. He owns the uh, biggest soccer club in London, I forget, yeah. So he's hanging out in his yacht, not hanging out in Chukotka much. Yes, ma'am. Mike? I've heard, is that better? Mm -hmm. I've heard, especially on street corners in Vladivostok and, and other areas of Russia, elderly people talking, particularly elderly men who had formerly been in the military, and they say, I, and I don't understand Russian all that well, but I understand this. We need another Stalin. When we had Stalin, the world respected us. And that is an attitude I've seen. Well, there's a long Russian history, given the start started with the czars and even before that, that Russians, uh, there's something in the psyche where they like strong leaders. And I think that that's what Putin really appeals to. Um, like I said, all these crazy pictures of him that we all snicker at, Russians love that stuff. And uh, when we were in the Far East, I met exactly one person in two weeks who did not like Putin. Everybody else loved the guy. They had pictures of him in their houses and their offices. So it just 
uh, shows you the different mindset that we have and you know the huge barrier that we have to start getting along again. That it? The seal? Oh, that's all? It looks like that might be it. Well, thank okay. you very much. I hope that you uh, found Thanks so much. It's our pleasure. All right, so uh, we discuss next week's. Is that here with Rebecca, or is that the National Historical Park? So we'll see you all over there, and bring, bring a guest with you. More, more the merrier. Thank you, David, very much.